Hello and welcome to um, what will be the first of two lectures on the limits of reason and the philosophy of common sense. Um, after these two lectures, we will just have two more lectures within this topic, and then we'll be ready for our second exam. I know it's, it's hard to believe things are moving quickly. Um, what, what I want to talk about in these next two lectures is about the, the fallout, the consequences of the failure of Descartes' project. I think that there is almost sort of unanimous agreement that in the most important senses Descartes' project uh, fails. Where there is enormous disagreement is where that failure should lead us. And so uh, the, the, the topic that we're, the subject that we're getting into now for today and for, for next time uh, is going to look at one um, one option, one way of dealing with the failure uh, of the Cartesian project. And so let's just sort of get ourselves situated. Let's map out what some of the main responses to Descartes' uh, uh, predicament have been, so what, what some of the historically important responses have been, and then I will focus on the, the line of response that I'm going to be interested in and that I'm going to talk about in this course. Um, it looked, uh, at the end of last time, it really looked like Descartes had run into a, a wall. In trying to vindicate a strong notion of individual intellectual autonomy and competence, in trying to uncover rational grounds for all of our beliefs, uh, we discovered, alas, that no such grounds are forthcoming, right? So Descartes has this very strong sense, and indeed most of the main line Enlightenment thinkers have this very strong uh, notion of human intellectual uh, autonomy, that is that, 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 that the individual um, pursues knowledge on his or her own, and human intellectual competence, that the individual is able to pursue and acquire knowledge on his or her own. Um, Descartes starts with a very strong, operates with a very strong sense of this, and in order to vindicate this, wants to show that all human beliefs can be rationally justified. That is, that everything, that, that a human being is essentially a rational thinking entity who is capable of going out and acquiring knowledge about the world, and that this is reflected in the process of justification, in the, uh, the, the finding of rational reasons for belief. The problem was that when, when Descartes tries to tra chase down those rational reasons, uh, we find ourselves uh, coming up empty. Indeed, we concluded by the end of last time that there really is no rational ground for believing that anything, process, or objective truth exists independently of our own minds. And this is a sort of a shocking conclusion to come to in light of the the kind of optimism, the hope, the aspiration that Descartes and the rest of the mainline Enlightenment thinkers, I'm thinking particularly of John Locke, who we also explored and which are in some important ways very similar to Descartes, this is sort of a shocking conclusion to come to. Um, you, come, you, you, know, you think about historically where, 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 where we're standing, um, the Enlightenment comes after centuries uh, of medieval civilization um, in which human beings were lived both practically, politically, and intellectually, spiritually under external authorities. The whole idea of the Enlightenment was the idea of the individual standing on his or her own two feet um, and being able to uh, rationally pursue their own ideas, their own beliefs, and now we find out that at the end of the day none of our beliefs have any rational grounds or justification. This is a shocking conclusion to come to uh, and a great disappointment if indeed that's where we are left. And so, now, now it's important to understand, Descartes himself did not think that he had failed um, and 
given how similar John Locke's views are to Descartes, remember John Locke comes in right after Descartes, and certainly John Locke's theory of perception, the basic notion of ideas, uh, the basic theory of ideas, uh, the primary secondary quality distinction, this basic picture of the human being's relationship to the world and the manner in which knowledge is acquired um, is roughly the same, uh, although there, were some, there are some significant differences as we discussed. Neither Locke nor Descartes believe that their own work has failed, but as the Enlightenment continues on and as the thinkers sort of, as the progression of thinkers continues after Descartes, there is increasingly a realization that, um, that the central elements of this project, and let's call it the Enlightenment project, just for lack of a better name for it, that this Enlightenment project uh, had serious problems, if not uh, that it had run completely aground. What we're going to talk about in the next two, the, the next two lectures, that, so that's the rest of this one and the next one, are, are two things. Are two, there are two things I want to ad address. The first is I want to meditate upon the chief reasons for the failure of Descartes' project. In, in other words, it'll be useful to us after we've gone through our, our sketch of the project um, to step back and look at it again and ask, okay, where did it run aground? The second thing I want to discuss, and indeed the second thing will take up more of our time, is, is where one goes from there. So in light of the failure of Descartes' project, where, where, do, we, where do we go next? And that, that general question I'm going to break down into two smaller questions. First, what should our attitude be with regard to uh, the external world and objective truth? In light of Descartes' failure to show that our belief in the existence of things, processes, and truths outside our own minds, okay, given that Descartes has failed to justify the belief in the existence of things, processes, and truths outside of our own minds, what should our attitude be about things, processes, and truths outside our own minds? And the second question, uh, the second sort of part of this second question is that I'd like to, like to ask, in light of Descartes' failure, how should we think about human rationality and more generally, how should we think about human nature? Right, right, the Enlightenment project carries with it at its center a very strong picture of human nature, that the human being is defined essentially by rational thought, by his capacity for rational thought. And that this not only defines him, but in a sense uh, comprises much of, of his dignity, of much of human beings' dignity. And what I want to ask is, given that the Cartesian picture, uh, the Cartesian project is a failure, given that we have failed to vindicate this no very strong notion of the rational individual, the rational human being, what should our attitude about human rationality, about human nature be? Do we need to rethink our picture of humanity, and what should that rethinking consist of? Now, there is, there is widespread agreement with respect to the first question. That is, there is a, a, a good amount of agreement about why Descartes' project failed, and I will only touch upon two of the main reasons for the failure. But there have been an enormous number and variety of views at, uh, with respect to where we should go from here. Right? So there's a great diversity of opinion in the literature about what one should do in light of the failure of Descartes' project, what our answer should be to this second cluster of questions that I just outlined. Okay. And so let me, let me just sort of now just very briefly sketch what some of the main responses have been. And then I will identify which line of response I'm most in sympathy which, with and which line of response I will talk about in the course. Then we'll turn back to the question of the reasons for Descartes' failure. Um, and then I'll lead us into what will be our, our next lecture next time. Okay. That's, that's, so that's what we'll do for the rest of, the rest of this period. 
So let's, let's just sketch out what some of the main historical uh, responses have been to the failure of Descartes' project. And there really are two varieties of response although within each of those varieties there are many different versions. Okay? One variety of response essentially remains sympathetic to Descartes' overall motivations. So it remains sympathetic to the basic idea of the Enlightenment project, to show that the individual human being is defined by reason and that his rationality, in a sense, uh, and, th and that his rationality makes him capable of acquiring knowledge of the universe uh, on his own. And so these philosophers have tended to hold on to the basic ambitions of the project and just say, look, Descartes' version of this didn't work, maybe John Locke's version of this didn't work, but we need to try some other version. Um, such, su such a person was Immanuel Kant. Immanuel Kant remained committed to the idea of enlightenment. Indeed, he was one of the key Per, uh, personalities, the key figures in philosophy to define the Enlightenment project. Kant said and defined Enlightenment as uh, 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 man's resting himself free from his self-incurred tutelage, uh, by which Kant meant um, that Enlightenment occurs when the individual uh, rests his mind away from the influence of others, from the influence of dogmas, and opens himself to the truth and acquires the truth on his own by his own efforts. So one very influential response to the failure of the basic Cartesian project is Immanuel Kant's. Kant remained committed to the idea of the Enlightenment. He believed that there simply must be a way to demonstrate the rationality of our beliefs, especially in the external world and an objective truth. And so he simply pressed on. Right? He said, well, Descartes failed, but I'm going to try even harder. Um, he produced an even more elaborate project than Descartes, um, although it is, a, it, is, it is essentially a Cartesian-inspired program, um, which culminated in a massive and somewhat impenetrable work, uh, Kant's most important and well-known work, which is the Critique of Pure Reason, that was published in 1781. So this is one response essentially hold on to Descartes' basic motivations, ideas, ambitions, and simply press on even harder in the hope of getting past that, st that sticking point that Descartes never got past. A very different reaction, but still I think one that is in sympathy with the Basic Enlightenment project, was the reaction of Bishop George Berkeley. He also held on to the essential idea of individual intellectual rationality and autonomy. So he's going to also basically buy into, Barclay's going to basically buy into, the essential enlightenment picture of human nature uh, and human rationality. But Barclay, what's wonderful about Barclay is how um, consistent he is. Barclay says, look, Yes, human beings are defined by reason, which translates into um, the idea that human beings should only believe those things which have rational justification. The only beliefs of, that we have rational justification for are beliefs in our own existence and in the contents of our own thoughts, that is, in our own ideas. And so Barclay concludes that all that exists in the world are minds and ideas. La Barclay gives up on the notion that there exists any external world or objective truths at all. For Barclay, the entire furniture of the universe consists of minds and thoughts. As I said, this is a very consistent position. If you accept the idea that human beings are rational, if you accept the idea that what this means is that human beings should only believe that which is justified, and if, as a result of Descartes' project, you conclude that the only things that we have justification for believing in are our own existence and our thoughts, then you must conclude that those are the only things that exist. This position is known as, in the literature, is commonly known as phenomenalism. It is a form of what's called anti-realism, meaning it's anti-realist about the external world and about uh, objective, mind-independent truth. 
A third reaction, altogether more pessimistic and indeed less credulous. There's something slightly credulous about Barclay's view, right? Um, this notion that uh, everything that exists is merely a, a, an idea in the mind. Another more pessimistic but also perhaps less credulous view, um, and yet again one that I still think is in sympathy with the larger ideas of the Enlightenment, uh, holds the following. It accepts the picture of human rationality basically identified by Descartes. It accepts the idea that this picture requires that, humans only, that human beings only believe in those things which have rational grounds. But it concludes from the failure of Descartes' project that no beliefs are justified. In other words, the conclusion it draws from Descartes' failure is that, well, if Descartes failed to vindicate um, the rationality of our beliefs in the external world and the belief in objective truth that is mind-independent truth, um, well, then that shows that none of our beliefs are justified. And if we're to be consistent with our Enlightenment outlook, that means we shouldn't believe anything. We should suspend all belief. Um, this position, in other words, these people are skeptics. That is, they come to a skeptical conclusion. This position is known as Pyrrhonism. And the name comes from a radical skeptical sect that belongs to the Hellenistic period of ancient Greece. So there, were, there, was, a, there was a radical sect of skeptics in the Hellenistic period in the ancient world um, which held this a view very much like this. That sect, were, they, they were called the Pyrrhonists. Their view was called Pyrrhonism. And um, those modern 18th century uh, thinkers, skeptical thinkers, were often referred to uh, also as Pyrrhonists. Finally, and I'm only, this is only finally with respect to my list, this is by no means represents the last of all the possible and even actual historical responses to Descartes, um, but finally, for our little list here, another group of philosophers based in Scotland took an entirely different approach. All right, so, so, so every response that I've just mentioned accepts the basic Enlightenment outlook. It accepts the basic idea of the Enlightenment project. There's a simple, simply a disagreement as to what that basic picture entails given the failure of the Cartesian version of it. Okay. The next response that I'm going to discuss, and it's the one that I am most sympathetic to, does not accept the basic enlightenment picture. In other words, its response is not to say, okay, this picture is correct, Descartes simply messed it up, so what do we do now? What this line of response says, this distinctively Scottish line of response says, is we don't accept the basic set of, the initial set of assumptions. We don't accept the basic enlightenment picture. Indeed, it's the enlightenment picture itself that's to blame for the failure of the project. And any version of it is going to yield some kind of skeptical outcome, some kind of Pyrrhonist or phenomenalist outcome. Because if you think about it, phenomenalism is simply the sunny side of Pyrrhonism. Right? Right? I mean, the Pyrrhonist is simply the gloomy side of uh, phenomenalism, if you want to put it that way. Right, the phenomenalist says, says, well, the external world doesn't exist, but the universe c does exist. It simply consists of minds and thoughts. To the Pyrrhonist, that means nothing exists. Right? I mean, that means, that means that there's no reason to believe in anything. Um, this, this, this other group, this, this, this Scottish response that I'm going to talk about here, and I will give it a name in a minute so I don't have to keep calling it the other group or the Scottish response, it questions the Enlightenment picture altogether. And it says, look, every version that you're going to try of this basic Enlightenment picture, of this um, 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 Enlightenment project, any version of it is going to come to the same, uh, call it sticky end, the same um, skeptical conclusions, the same uh, failures. 
They not only question the uncompromising conception of rationality offered by Descartes, in other words, they're going to reject this notion that in order to be rational, every one of your beliefs has to be rationally justified. They're going to say that's an entirely all too strong conception of rationality. And they also even went farther and questioned whether indeed rationality should be considered the defining characteristic of a human being. Furthermore, they argue that the very possibility of knowing anything requires that some, thing be ta some things be taken as given without proof. So, so this, 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 this group of thinkers is going to say, look, if your ambition is to show how knowledge is possible, knowledge is only possible if some things are taken for granted. Knowledge is impossible if the demand for justification is going to go all the way down to the bottom. They're going to, they're going to, they're going to say that justification itself, the very practice of reasoning, presumes that you assume things without reason. In other words, reasoning can't get going unless you believe some things first, and obviously those things can't be reasoned to, because they provide the grounds in which reason, reasoning begins. And this, I, I will, we will go into this in much more detail. I just want to give you a sense of how this m very radical type of response attempts to, to solve the problems by getting outside the entire framework saying, look, it's not Descartes' fault, it's the framework's fault. And all you guys, all you other guys, who want to keep working in the framework are simply going to keep coming to the same dead end. This position is known as Scottish naturalism. Alternatively, it's sometimes referred to as the philosophy of common sense. And its chief architects were two Scottish philosophers of the 18th century, uh, David Hume and Thomas Reed. It is indeed this last position with which I am in the greatest sympathy. I will not say that it is the majority position today, but it is a position that has enjoyed a significant resurgence of, of esteem and popularity. Um, it's, it's, its number is on the, its star is on the rise again after, after a relatively long hiatus in which it was virtually ignored. Um, throughout much of the er first half of the 20th century, um, this, this, this line of response to the, to the basic problem of the Enlightenment um, has, was pretty much ignored. It kind of dis it was very popular when it came out in the late 18th century. It was very popular in the 19th century for at least a while. Then it kind of disappeared off the radar screen, and now there's been a resurgence of interest in Scottish naturalism. Um, it is the position with which I'm in the greatest sympathy. I've published a number of articles. Um, Arguing, uh, arguing that, that, that the Scottish naturalist position can be employed to solve a whole number of contemporary epistemological problems as well as these classic ones. Um, and, it, and it will be the lens through which I address the two questions I posed at the beginning of this lecture regarding uh, the reasons for the failure of Descartes' project and where we should go from here. So I am going to take on the Scottish naturalist mantle in trying to diagnose what went wrong with Descartes' project and in trying to make suggestions of where to go from here. You should be aware, however, that this is only one potential line of response, um, and it is not, not even necessarily the majority or most popular line of response. I would suspect that probably the most popular lines of response have been, um, has been the Kantian one. Let me just say a few things about these two, um, these two architects of Scottish naturalism. Um, first David Hume and then Thomas Reed. Um, Hume is generally regarded as the greatest English-speaking philosopher of the Enlightenment. That is, of all the philosophers of the Enlightenment who wrote in English. Um, because, of course, the Enlightenment occurred across Europe. You had an Enlightenment in France, you had an Enlightenment in Germany, and you had an Enlightenment in England and Scotland. Um, Hume is considered to be the greatest philosopher of the English-speaking world in the Enlightenment. He also is the most influential Enlightenment philosopher in the English-speaking world today. That is, if you were to take a look at the work, the, at the philosophical work that's been done over the last century in the English-speaking world, so in America, um, the British Isles, Australia, and Canada, um, by far the most significant, important Enlightenment philosopher is David Hume. 
Hume did not attain the kind of status in his lifetime that he should have given uh, his brilliance and given the impact of what he was writing. And the reason largely was because Hume was a publicly avowed atheist. And it was very difficult to be an atheist in the 18th century and get anywhere in life. Um, most of the philosophers, thinkers, politicians who were inclined to be atheists um, were, would at least publicly profess some form of deism, um, if not a full-blown theistic religious outlook, um, simply because to be an atheist was, 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 would, would, be, would, would be to kill your career. And so Hume was rejected for a number of very prestigious academic posts because of his atheism. Nonetheless, Hume wrote a very popular, at the time and still popular, History of Britain, a multi-volume history of Britain. Um, he's most famous in his philosophical work for three works, his Treatise on Human Nature, his Enquiries Concerning Human Understanding and the Principles of Morals, and his Dialogues Concerning Natural Religion. I will tell you that Hume is one, has been one of the greatest influences on my own work. Um, and I, I hope that you will find him as, as interesting as, and as insightful as I do. The second of the architects of the, Sco of the Scottish naturalist um, school of thought is Thomas Reed. Uh, Reed held prestigious professorships at both the University of Aberdeen and the University of Glasgow, both in Scotland, of course. In Glasgow, he actually took over the chair that had been vacated by Adam Smith. Adam Smith, of course, being the inventor of modern capitalist economic theory, um, as well as a very important moral philosopher in his own right. Um, Reed uh, took over his chair at Glasgow when Smith uh, uh, resigned it. Reed is the one who is credited for actually founding the Scottish naturalist or common sense philosophy uh, school of thought. Hume really laid the essential foundations for the philosophy of common sense, but it's Reed who actually coined the term, um, and Hume himself never uh, uh, self-avowed as a common sense philosopher. And there has been an evolution in Hume's scholarship. Um, the view on what Hume really is has changed substantially since the publication in the 1950s of Norman Kemp Smith's uh, enormously influential and important book on Hume. Um, the view used to be, the pre-Kemp Smith view, was that Hume was essentially a skeptic, not entirely unlike Berkeley, that Hume, uh, that Hume came to somewhat sort of phenomenalistic conclusions, um, that he was a skeptic, but that he was a kind of a cheerful one as opposed to a gloomy one like the Pyrrhonists. Hume is very, very clear that he opposes the Pyrrhonist response to Descartes. But with, starting with Kemp Smith's uh, work, Hume has increasingly begun to be seen as a precursor to Scottish naturalism, if not a full-blown Scottish naturalist himself. Um, and um, certainly, he set many of the foundational ideas in place for the philosophy of common sense. And as far as I'm concerned, my own view is that Hume belongs firmly in the Scottish naturalist camp um, and is in no way a skeptic. He certainly employs skepticism. He employs doubt uh, as a method of argument, in much in the way that Descartes does. Um, but Hume himself does not come to skeptical conclusions, in my view. Again, I don't know that I would say that this is the majority view on Hume, although I would, I, I would say that the, the, the accurate depiction of the situation in the scholarship today is that the opinion is pretty evenly split on, on the older view of Hume and the newer view of Hume. Let me um, just talk a little bit about some of the widely agreed upon reasons for the failure of Descartes' project. And I'm going to talk about this to a large extent through the lens of Scottish naturalism. As I said, I'm going to take on the mantle of Scottish naturalism from now on as we discuss this topic. And that's fine. We have to take on one mantle or another. You should just be aware that it is only one way of thinking about and one way of replying to uh, Descartes' project, not the only way.
Um, one reason for the failure of Descartes' project, and it's a reason that both Hume and Reed point out, is of course what I've called the double object theory of perception. Reed calls it the ideal theory of perception, and I will, I will, I will alternatively speak of it as the theory of ideas, um, the double object view of perception, the ideal view of perception. I will alternatively use these expressions um, um, in as much as they all refer to the same thing. Okay. Right. They refer to this view in which we have, in a sense, two objects of awareness. Right, that in our cognitive interaction, that in our cognitive activity, we have two objects of awareness: an immediate object of awareness, a direct object of awareness, and a secondary, indirect object of awareness. Right, the immediate object of awareness is an idea, a mental representation, a thought, however you want to, whatever you want to call it. We've we've used all of these words. The immediate object of awareness is a mental representation, an idea, a thought. The secondary object of awareness is an external, an external object, process, or an objective truth. A, a mind-independent object, process, or objective truth. We only have indirect access to that. In other words, our knowledge of that external object, of our, our, our knowledge of that second object, is mediated through our knowledge of the first. Right. That is the double object view of perception. That is the ideal theory, as Reed calls it, the theory of ideas, as I've alternatively called it. And it is cited as one of the chief reasons for the failure of the project. Remember, in this double object view, the following two things are acknowledged. One, it is acknowledged that the second object uh, may not resemble the first. Right, so remember, our ideas have all sorts of characteristics that the external object event process does not have. For one thing, secondary qualities. So it is first and foremost acknowledged that there may be a, a, a lack of resemblance between the first object and the second. But even more problematically, it's acknowledged that the first object may exist where there is no second object. In other words, my mental podium, right, my idea of a podium, may be caused by an actual podium, which it may not resemble, or may be entirely generated by my own mind. That is, there may be no external podium, as in the case of a dream or a hallucination. Right, so both of these caveats are acknowledged by the proponents of the ideal theory, by the theory of ideas, by the double object view. We discover this in meditation one through the process of doubt. But then we, see, we can see how the ideal theory sets itself up for its own uh, collision. Right? For it, it sets itself up for its own fall. Because no method or procedure, no proof, let's say, as, as Descartes tries to do, no proof of God's existence and benevolent intentions, is going to succeed in bridging this gap between the two objects, between the first object and the second. There's going to be no procedure, no method, no proof that's going to allow me to know that there is an external object and that I'm right about what the external object is like, because any, of, any, any such procedure, method, or proof will be subject to the very same doubts that we're trying to overcome. Right? So, so put, this, put this bluntly. <coughs> the very same doubts that lead me to wonder whether there is a podium are also going to lead me to doubt whether my proof for the, po being the existence of the podium is a valid proof. <laughs> the problem is that the doubts that arise in the, in the first meditation are so powerful that no procedure or method can overcome them. <clears throat> so
so what we wind up with then, we end up with precisely the skepticism that we sought to avoid, right? that we sought to overcome. The whole idea was to overcome doubt and show how all our beliefs can be based in rational grounds. And instead, what we wound up with was even bigger doubts than when we started. Hume offers an absolutely uh, lovely description of what I've just said, and obviously he, he says it in a way much better than I do, um, uh, in your selections. And I'm going to read an extended quotation that begins on the bottom of page 152 and carries on to 153. Quote, by what argument can it be proved that the perceptions of the mind must be caused by external objects entirely different from them, though resembling them, if that be possible, and could not arise either from the energy of the mind itself or from the suggestion of some invisible and unknown spirit or from some other cause still more unknown to us? It is acknowledged that, in fact, many of these perceptions arise not from anything external, as in dreams, madness, and other diseases. And nothing can be more explicable than the manner in which body should so operate upon mind as ever to convey an image of itself to a substance supposed of so different and even contrary in nature. It is a question of fact whether the perceptions of the, of the senses be produced by external objects resembling them. How shall this question be determined? By experience, surely as all other questions of a like nature. But here, experience is and must be entirely silent. The mind has never anything present to it but the perceptions and cannot possibly reach any experience of their connection with objects. The supposition of such a connection is, therefore, without any foundation in reasoning. To have recourse to the veracity of the Supreme Being in order to prove the veracity of our senses, here he's targeting Descartes' appeal to God, to have recourse to the, very verac to the veracity of the Supreme Being in order to prove the veracity of our senses is surely making a very unexpected circuit. That's wonderful dryness there. If his veracity were at all concerned in this matter, our senses would be entirely infallible, because it is not possible that he can ever deceive. Not to mention that, if the external world be called into question, we shall be at a loss to find arguments by which we may prove the existence of that being or any of his attributes. In other words, he was saying, if we can't even prove that the podium exists, how does Descartes hope to prove that God exists? So this is, I think, a lovely summary of the predicament that the theory of ideas gets us into. What we see here is Hume saying uh, uh, that it is the theory of ideas itself that is to blame for the failure of Descartes' project. And the implication then is that any theory that works within that rubric is going to fail. Okay. Reed has a very similar attitude. Reed also blames the ideal theory for the failures of the Cartesian project. And Reed asks the question, see, Hume never abandons the ideal theory. Hume accepts the double object of perception. Hume is just simply prepared to live with uncertainty. Hume is prepared to live with the idea that human beings just aren't as rational as Descartes would like them to be. Right? Hume is famous for rejecting the Enlightenment picture of human beings and of human rationality. Okay. Reed, however, wants to abandon the ideal theory. Like Hume, he blames the failure of, of, of Descartes' project on the ideal theory. Unlike Hume, however, Reed wants to know, why should we accept the ideal theory? So on page 23 of your Reed selections, in se at the bottom of section 7, Reed says, Descartes' system of the human understanding, which I shall beg leave to call the ideal system, and which, with some improvements made by later raiders, is now generally received, hath some original defect. So he's saying, this theory of ideas that everybody seems to agree to, that everybody seems from Descartes to Locke seems to accept, has some original defect. Quote, that this skepticism is inlaid in it and reared along with it, and therefore that we must lay it open to the foundation and examine the materials before we can expect to raise any solid and useful fabric of knowledge on this subject. So he's saying, 
the very seeds of cataclysmic, deadly doubt are, are in the very nature of the ideal theory, of the double object theory. And until we question and bring down that double object theory, that ideal theory of perception, we're not going to get anywhere uh, in the theory of knowledge. A second reason for the failure of Descartes' project is what I would call an excessively rationalistic view of human beings and excess, an excessive optimism about the prospects for human knowledge. Um, and to a certain degree, I think that the Enlightenment project sets itself up for failure, sets up human beings for failure by raising the bar of rationality far too high. Right? So it both has an excessive conception of reason, one that no human being is ever going to meet, and it is also excessively optimistic about what human beings ultimately can know. Right? At the peak of the sort of enlightenment, um, how shall I say, I don't want to call it a frenzy because that suggests something sort of irrational, but at the, sort of the, at the peak of the flush of the enlightenment enthusiasm, let's call it, um, there really was, uh, there was articulated the view that one day human beings will know everything. Uh, Descartes actually says in the Discourse on Method that once we sort of have our epistemology right, once we, we, once we are placing our, our beliefs entirely on rational footing, he literally says that there is nothing that human beings will not know. Um, What I want to say and what both Hume and Reed believe is that this is a serious overreach and that this kind of overreach, in a sense, sets itself up for failure. It makes human rationality and reasonableness conditional upon perfect justification. And perfect justification is never going to be forthcoming. It is never going to be the case that every human belief can be shown to have a rational ground. And in light of that fact, to define human reasonableness in terms of having such a perfect track record of justification uh, is to set human beings up for failure. Furthermore, it hang the, the Cartesian project hangs human nature and human dignity on this excessive expectation. Right? So now, if human beings are not revealed to be perfectly rational, it means that they're not rational, and thus are, in a sense, diminished in the eyes of the Enlightenment. And finally, it, it, it fails to recognize the essentially hesitant, probabilistic character of most knowledge. If you actually look at the major knowledge-acquiring endeavors that we engage in, and of course the largest is natural science, but we also have social and applied science, we have um, mathematics, we have... Take any major knowledge acquiring endeavor. And I think that you will find that it is characterized by, hesita by great hesitation, by fitful starts and stops, by f moving forward to one step, moving backwards, sometimes two, and overall by, by a kind of probabilism, a sense in which Whatever it is we claim to know uh, now is revisable later. I would say that this is, the, this is a great strength of the knowledge endeavor, if you want to call it that. But in the Enlightenment ver vision, um, this uh, is, in a sense, unacceptable. The light, in the Enlightenment version, uh, knowledge has to be complete, has to be perfect, um, and the idea of hesitation or of probabilism um, is sort of uh, not enter is not to be entertained. I think that this points to a certain irony. Right? There's a certain irony in the in the fact in general in, in, in that the Enlightenment, which saw itself and those people in the sort of who are on board with the Enlightenment project saw itself as kind of liberating human beings from the oppressions of church, of monarchy, of feudal landlord, in a sense by li liberating the human being by by rationalizing him, 
and ennobling the human being by elevating him in his rational, in his rational uh, state. And the irony is that with the failure of the project, human beings wind up being um, uh, um, demoted, right? rendered less noble, and uh, less independent in their knowledge. Right? If you think about the, the, both the Pyrrhonist and the, and the Barclay, the phenomenalist response to Descartes, and if we meditate on Descartes' failure, there's sort of a terrible irony in the fact that this great effort at liberation and of lifting up winds up bringing us further back than we were before and lower than we were before. Um, if you want to talk about a specific irony, um, the ideal theory, the theory of perception, the double object view, which we've said is, is a culprit in all of this, was conceived by philosophers and presented as an advancement over what they called the vulgar view. Now the vulgar view, of course, or the common view, the common view, of course, is that when you perceive something, right, that this is a book. Not an idea of a book, not a mental picture of a book where the book is some second object beyond my senses that I can only infer or deduce, but that when I look at this, I'm looking at an actual object. That was deemed the vulgar view, the common view, and philosophers presented the ideal theory as a much more rational view, a more enlightened view of perception, one that takes into account all of these problems that were raised by dreaming and by hallucination and such. Isn't it ironic then that while the vulgar view leaves us with an external world and with knowledge, the more sophisticated advanced view leads us nowhere but to skepticism and doubt. Um, Hume observes this irony on pages 151 to 152 of your reading. <coughs> Excuse me. He says, at the bottom of 151, he says, he's talking about the ordinary man. He says, um, always suppose the very images presented by the senses to be the external objects. In other words, the ordinary person presumes this to be an object, a book, not an idea. All right, so the ordinary person always supposes the very images presented by the senses to be the external objects and never entertain any suspicion that the one are nothing but representations of the other. This very table, which we see white and which we feel hard, is believed to exist independent of our perception and to be something external to our mind which perceives it. In other words, this is the common vulgar view. He goes on. But this universal and primary opinion of all men is soon destroyed by the slightest philosophy, which teaches us that nothing can ever be present to the mind but an image or perception, and that the senses are only the inlets through which these images are conveyed. Right? So this vulgar view, this ordinary view, the view that everybody holds, basically, about our relationship to the external world, um, is, is, is rejected by the Enlightenment in favor of the more rational double object view. And the terrible irony is that that more rational view actually lands us in a worse position than we were on the vulgar view. It takes the external world away from us, and it takes knowledge away from us. It leaves us with nothing but doubt. Next time, we're going to begin talking about the actual details of the Scottish naturalist position. We've done a lot of setup, a lot of build up. I've sort of tried to situate us, show us all of these different reactions to the failure of Descartes' project, this larger question of what our attitude should be towards the larger Enlightenment project in light of the failure of this project, of, of, the, of the Cartesian version of the project. Um, I've talked a little bit about Scottish naturalism. I've explained my preference for it and, 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 and said that we are going to, in a sense, continue from now on through that avenue. Next time we're going to pursue that avenue in its full detail, or as full detail as can be done in a, in a, in a, in a one-hour lecture. Um, so next time we'll, we'll, we'll get into the details of the Scottish natural response to the failure of the Cartesian project. Um, in terms of things to think about, stick with the ones I've already given you uh, in the last lecture. They will, they will serve you very well as you continue to read uh, uh, David, the selections from David Hume and from Thomas Reed. Thank you very much, and I'll see you all next time.